All right. And now we proceed to the poster pitching session. Those of you, of you who never uh, did the poster pitching, it's the um, opportunity for poster presenters to make a five minutes um, pitching of their poster to um, introduce themselves and to maybe to raise interest and to explain in uh, very briefly what is their posters about, what is the story behind this poster. Yeah, so uh, I don't think we need uh, like anybody to introduce people separately. We don't need a head or chair of the session. We just uh, proceed one by one as it is written in the program. Yeah, that's good. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Paulina Janik. Uh, I'm from Institute of Botany, Polish Academy of Sciences. Sorry, I feel a little bit confused because <laughs> it's a strange situation <laughs> for me. Okay, so uh, I have a poster uh, just in the in, in the entrance, and this is about Nivicolos myxomycetes um, in Tatra Mountains. They are first um, molecular data about this uh, about this group from this uh, mountain range. And <clears throat> okay, so Nivicolos myxomycetes are just uh, strictly defined ecological guild of species, and Besides that, many mountain ranges have been surveyed so far. There are still some understudied regions, and one of them is uh, our Tatra Mountains. And so we we take several field trips, and we collected um, about nine hundred collections, and we um, uh, we then. Um, uh, put them, subject them to the molecular analysis of, of the first part of a uh, small ribosomal subunit, which is regarded as bar barcode. Then we um, then we uh, put them in the haplotype and representative for each haplotype were then uh, checked in the public gene bank database. And based on this data, we found that uh, for each genera, we had uh, Mm, some unique sequences for Tatra Mountains, but most of them were just the same as in the other regions. So uh, we can say that uh, that uh, besides that there are many, many haplotypes were common, there are also some unique for Tatra Mountains. And so this mountain massives can be uh, interesting in that, uh, at that point, especially that they are very understood it. Um, mountains. <laughs> so, more or less, I can invite you just to read, and I will be there <laughs> to explain more if you want. Uh, I'm Miriam de Haan. I'm from Belgium, and I work at uh, Bot a massive botanic garden. So, uh, I have three posters, <laughs> but no presentations this time. So uh, uh, the first one is on the myxomycetes of uh, Mayotte. Um, I did it a while ago, but there were some new data. So I added it and uh, made a nice collage of the <laughs> species that were found. Uh, then the next one is on the maize project that we are uh, already working a long time on uh, since 2016, I think. And uh, together with Mark Lemons and uh, Hans Gangel, and uh, and now I had a master student who did a more intensive study on um, in maize fields in Belgium to see what's growing there. Nothing special, but that's not the point uh, because we want these uh, mix of my seeds to help in uh, the 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 war against. Uh, Mixotoxic toxicogenic uh, fungi. So we need them to grow everywhere and to be uh, um, common, let's say, and it's not nothing special. So now we've uh, published it, and so we know what's growing on maize in in uh, in Flanders. Well, and then the last one is on because we had our anniversary of two hundred and twenty-five years. 
of Mesa Botanic Garden. Uh, but first, it was the National Botanic Garden in Brussels. But then we moved to Mesa, uh, a much better location. It's a very heavy poster with lots of information. And I wanted to put on put in much more, but of course I didn't have a. Uh, but I'm inviting you to go and see. There's lots of uh, nice uh, uh, facts and figures to know, because and I'm also introducing on top here uh, our team. That's all. The, everyone who is working um, among many other things on mix of my seats uh, in the collection. Um, there are also next to the poster QR codes, so can you you can download the posters and the two publications that uh, are the one on Mayotte and the one uh, of the Maze, uh, so you can download them for free. Then a small announcement: I I'm going to give a postcard around. You can sign it. It's for Marianne Meyer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Anastasia Kucherkina, um, and uh, I also have a poster during this congress. I made a small presentation presentation to show some extra pictures of a beautiful place where I was doing my research. Yes. So uh, the title of my poster is First Systematic Moist Chamber Study of Myxomycetes on the Island Hidden Zea, Germany. Demonstrates the arid nature of the myxomycete biota at the Baltic Sea coast. So I think I have the most long title of the poster uh, among others. So um, what is actually hidden there? Sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no? Oh, yeah. Perfect. What is actually hidden there? It's a small island in the Baltic Sea. Oops, sorry. Uh, I wanted to show. Uh huh. Here, here it is. So the picture a little bit bigger. Um, it's located. Uh, west of Germany's large island Rügen on the German coast. It's about 16.5 kilometers long and about 3.7 kilometers wide at its broadest part. So yeah, some it's a very beautiful place of very spectacular landscapes. So um, on this island is located the ornithological, uh, ornithological station of University of Greifswald and also the biological station for students. So as I'm right now working at the University of Greifswald, so during the beginning of November, we walked there at coastal heathlands and shrubberies to collect substrate for moist chamber experiment on the island. Um, we collected substrate for 103 moist chambers. Um, we collected some, well, just interesting stuff like ground and branch litter of Kaluna vulgaris, area litter of Sambucas nigra, bark of for three, three species. And of course, my favorite one um, is the dung of sheep and uh, cow. So, and that's how the moist chamber experiment looked like. So, and that's how I looked like when I was collected the uh, ground leader of Kaluna vulgaris. And what we received from this moist chamber experiment, you are welcomed to see on my poster in the hall uh, during the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Uh, dear friends, my name is Dmitro Leontiev. I am from Ukraine, and I would like to present a poster, What is Lycogala fusco violatum? And I must confess, I don't have an answer on this question. Uh, maybe you will help me to find it. So, um, in 1960s, a student from Denmark was traveling in Nepal and found a unique specimen of something which he brought to Copenhagen where the local expert Per Onsberg has studied it and decided that this is unusual Lycogala. 
And after consultation with Gebert Martin, uh, he described it as a species Lycogala fusco violetso. I was lucky to receive this interesting specimen for the study and was completely confused. Uh, if you look superficially on it, it really seems to be some kind of Lycogala, but even if you touch it, you understand that something goes wrong because it's very tough and inside it contains white threads covered with the um, spores attached to them, which look very similar with so-called capillicium structures in Chanel simplex, which, as you all know, was found to be not a myxomycete at all. If you look deeper, you see, however, structures which do not contain any fungal hypha, but are rather similar to the pseudocapillicium of reticularia, for example. If you look even deeper, being already sure that this is a kind of reticularia, you find spores which are extremely thick-walled, somewhat ovate, and bearing rather strange pores, which are elongated and look like no spore pores known in any myxomycetes there shown by arrows. If you look at the cortex, so when you see the spores, you start to think, okay, this is probably not a myxo. And then you look at the cortex and find typical structure of the combined cortex of any reticulation like cephoptychium or reticularia. And at this moment you say, okay, no, I am sure this is a myxomycete. And then you look to the spores again and find these very small meshes of very dense net and these extremely uh, strange pores and decide, okay, no, probably this is not a myxo. And this is actually what I know up to the moment. We are trying to extract DNA from it and we succeeded, but we could not sequence it probably because of a, it is too fragmented. Uh, so we are now looking for the new methodology, especially one which is used in archaeo or paleobiology to find at least some sequences and to understand at least is it fungus or mixo? <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Juliana. I'm from Ukraine, and I'm studying in uh, Charles University in Prague. Uh, I am interested in Nivicolas mixomyces, and in the same time, I'm interested in computer science and species distribution modeling. Uh, so for you to make it easier, let's imagine it's just a computer game. Um, Oh, thanks. So for my study, uh, I chose Lamproderma genus because it contains a lot of species and I noticed that the species are actually different in uh, their fructification time. Uh, as you see in this chart that uh, for some reason, they don't fructify for the whole year, all of them. So I thought they may differ in their um, uh, environmental requirements. And I tried to model their distribution to see if, if they actually different. So like the main goal was to understand if the special, spe special requirements are different between the subgroups I, I defined and determine which environmental factors influence their distribution. As we already talked yesterday uh, about some species distribution modeling works and some papers, uh, people were pointed that elevation is just the main factor which influences the distribution. But elevation is correlated with a lot of environmental factors like moisture availability, precipitation, temperature. So I thought maybe it's a combination of different environmental factors rather than elevation. And here you can see the workflow, what I've done. Uh, so I had some data and I want to say thank you for everyone who is putting their data in the open databases like GBIF. 
uh, thanks to you, I was able to obtain 3,000 and something of records. And also, uh, I developed a good network. So maybe some of you know me just because I was writing messages to you and asking for, for the data. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I used three different methods, but still, my work is just sitting in front of the laptop, right? So how, do, how can I know about if the model is actually working in the real world? Uh, I needed uh, expert assessment for that. So maybe some of you received some email and the form you need to fill. Uh, and I coded every single prediction. So you didn't know what the method was used. So I'm in really interested how you will react if you will see the whole uh, the results in, the, in my poster. Uh, and after I predicted it in, for the current climate, I tried to predict it for the future as well because there are such data sets available online. So that's, that's the whole work. But still, uh, I guess it was done well, like the model performed well. And you can see that the current distribution of this species to the left and what the distribution, like the, the fructification, because the whole data was about just finding sporocarps, right? So the future climate prediction is about what the distribution of this species will look like if we will switch to sustainable lifestyle, if we will stop producing this carbon dioxide and so on. I see the slight difference. So what's next? Uh, this poster is about my uh, diploma thesis for the master's degree. So I'm really waiting for your feedback because I uh, accept this Congress as a pre-defense. <laughs> yeah, so that's me in Georgia. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm waiting for you next to my poster. Okay, hello, good morning. And uh, yeah, the main question, what is Lamproderma and a three gene phylogeny? The history of this is that uh, my PhD was focused in this Lamproderma genus, and Marianne Meyer told me just focus on the maculated Lamproderma so that you start uh, with molecular studies. I had no clue even how not to take a pipette, but yeah, I was a very new by person with molecular studies. So this is a kind of my long way story, let's say. So this is my background. I am a taxonomist by heart, let's say. And I have always studied this uh, molecular delimitation and Lamproderma, as you may know, has a lot of different um, characters and they are very important to tear apart the species. So with Lamproderma, what are the main characters? You can see them here on one example. So mostly stalked sporocarps, shorter or larger stalk, then an iridescent peridium, a columella, reaching half or two thirds of the sproteca, then the capillation without the funnel ending, so telling apart from meriderma, and finally this lack of calcium carbonate, although we know now that this is within the fissurales. And here I brought you two examples that I really love. So this is Lamproderma pulveratum. You can see top right <laughs> the um, crystal, uh, the crystal that it has in the in the peridium, then as I told you, the columella is reaching more or less the center of the sporoteca and then uh, some images of the, of the spores that they are really, really characteristic. And this is a Lamproderma pseudomaculatum. Thanks to Marianne Meyer, this is a paratypus from her. So as you can see, this is more the typical Lamproderma that comes to your mind when you think about them. So what about similar genera? If I just ask you, the first thing that will come to your brain is the archaeopsis. So it's just a Lamproderma without the stalk and without a columella. And here we have two examples, also from Marianne Merrier. So the archaeopsis metallica and Kowalski. So as you can see, it's just some sessile Lamproderma and sometimes forming these uh, more plasmodiocarp forms. And as I told you, I was a new buy, but after all these years, I have a little bit more idea about how to study the, the molecular and the phylogenies. So what about previous ones? 
The first paper focused on Lamprodema was from Fioredono and collaborators. And as you can see, it's not only Lamproderma. So we have Coloderma and uh, Eliomyxa and Diacheopsis. They are colored in different um, colors. So as you can see, Lamproderma is not Lamproderma, it's something else. And then of course, uh, thanks to Dimitro and all of our other collaborators, they developed this uh, phylogeny. And as you can see, this is repeated again. So we have more genera inside Lamproderma than only Lamproderma. And even with these tiny arrows, you can see that they are also somewhere else. So with these two papers, then I, ooh, sorry, I reached to the conclusion that we had more than Lamproderma and the Archaeopsis. We had also Eliomix and Coloderma inside. And as you can see, we can separate them more or less like this. So Lamproderma and Eliomyxa are more or less more similar because they are stalked. They have this iridescent uh, peridium, but the main difference is this presence of an oily or waxy substances. And then on the other hand, or on the other side, we have the Archaeopsis and Coloderma. They even have at very young stages this presence of a gelatinous layer on top, so covering the sporocarp. And two examples, these unfortunately are not uh, my photos as the previous ones, but I took them, as you can see here, the reference, so from the Greek colleagues. This is Coloderma oculatum. So as you can see, we have this slimy surface, and then we have kind of a um, strange stalk, slimy stalk, but uh, it has a tendency to disappear. And finally, what we have is a Lyomixa. These uh, photos are from Sarah Lloyd. You have, again, the references uh, on the photos. And these are two examples, so Reticulus pora and uh, Therifera. So if you want to know what is going on with three genes and all these guys, just come and check my poster. Thank you so much. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Elisabetta Shepina, and I'm not a scientist, but an artist. <laughs> and it became a tradition, I guess, to uh, do some art for exams already. So first time I was in, my first exam was exam nine. It was in Japan. And for this exam, uh, that exam, I prepared uh, these three pictures for a poster session. <laughs> it was more uh you know in comic style maybe and it was uh where maximus maximus it's where still was like a part of uh maybe landscape or like an object <laughs> with which and main characters was actually animals <laughs> because maybe i wasn't so uh, still deep involved in this topic but already for the next exam which was uh, like exam 10 in the uh, costa rica I prepared already another one paintings. It was nine um, paintings on canvas printed. Uh, and um, yeah, it's already, the main character already was the Maximus, Maximus it itself. It was something dreamy and maybe impressionist uh, portraits of Maximus it's in, <laughs> in general way. And uh, for this exam, this time I decided to make something more in, like interior paintings. Uh, like to understand how uh, Mixamid seats can become the part of modern uh, interior or design or something like this to, you know, to, because uh, Mixamid seats is so beautiful object uh, and, um, but not a lot of people know about it. And it will be really interesting to make something like uh, this, like interior paintings. So people just put inside their interior some, Okay, painting with mixed mixes, and uh, maybe we even don't think about it. But when later we come to the forest and see something similar, we start to think, aha, the same pattern. Hmm, like at uh, this, my favorite restaurant, something like this. Maybe it's <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> I try to say something like this, but 
so it's really short presentation. Sorry, I'm not a speaker, but a paint and maker, <laughs> actually. So that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>